YouTube. In this video, we'll answer the question, why do helicopters sometimes take off vertically and other times take off like a plane? We'll look at the difference between single and multi-engine helicopter profiles and why one technique is used over another, depending on the circumstances and the performance of the helicopter. However, simply put, it depends on the type of the helicopter, the number of engines on board, the space available ahead and sometimes behind the takeoff and landing path. In a tight area or an elevated helipad on a hospital site, for example, a twin engine helicopter will take off going slightly backwards and upwards. So if there's any problem, it can land back on the helipad. If there's plenty of space available, helicopters often take off by accelerating forward before climbing, as this uses less power and therefore allows more fuel or payload to be carried. Before we get started with the differences, firstly we need to cover two certification standards for helicopters, either Cat A or Cat B. Cat A certified helicopters are capable to have sufficient performance for either a safe landing or safe continued flight if you lose an engine during takeoff. Whilst Cat B helicopters do not, either because they only have one engine or because the remaining engine is not powerful enough so a forced landing will occur. We'll first start with a single engine helicopter, which is Cat B. The normal takeoff profile is designed to keep you out of what's known as the dead man's curve, the height velocity diagram that is published in the flight manual. This graph shows you at what altitude and speed combinations a safe auto rotation landing may be achieved if correctly flown. This is an example of a practice auto rotation being flown in a Robinson R44 helicopter to Denham Airfield. the helicopter reaches within around 50 feet of the ground, the airspeed is progressively reduced in a flare manoeuvre before the collective is raised to cushion the landing with the ground. This is a high velocity diagram for the Robinson R66 single engine helicopter and a recommended takeoff profile is highlighted on the graph. The area to the left of the diagram is where you're at a low speed or an out of ground effect hover, but not sufficiently far away from the ground so that an auto rotation may not be successful, as you won't have enough height to accelerate the helicopter sufficiently and then flare before you impact the surface. Once you're high enough, you'll have enough time to convert potential energy from height into speed and safely land in the event of an engine failure. On the right hand side of the graph though, there's also a shaded area of low altitude and high speed, where if you had an engine failure, you may not have enough time to react and slow the helicopter before impact with the ground. Pilots try and minimise their time flying these two areas of the graph to increase their chances of safe landing if there is a critical malfunction. However, sometimes it is unavoidable, either because of the landing area or because of the type of operation they're performing, for example, in sling load operation or during the maximum performance takeoff, which we'll cover shortly. We'll now start to go through each takeoff profile in turn, providing a little bit more detail, starting with single engine helicopters, then moving on to multi engine helicopters. Here is an example of a Romsen R66 helicopter following the recommended takeoff profile from an airfield. The helicopter starts on a low four foot hover and smoothly accelerates as it transitions to forward flight. Around 40 knots, after passing through effective translational lift, the nose raises and the helicopter starts to climb, continuing to accelerate to around 60 knots, which is close to the best rate of climb speed. There's an engine failure during takeoff, then an immediate emergency landing is required, so the area ahead of the helicopter should be clear of any obstructions that might prevent a safe landing. When obstacles, such as building trees or power lines, are in front of the helicopter, prevent you from accelerating before climbing, a maximum performance takeoff is required. This maneuver requires more power to complete than a normal takeoff, so you need to check the helicopter performance before attempting it, as the outside air temperature, pressure, altitude, or helicopter weight may prevent you from being able to hover out of ground effect. This technique requires you to climb the helicopter vertically upwards until you clear the height of the obstructions, trees or buildings before accelerating forward. It's really important when doing this to select visual markers that you can see at all times in the cockpit to stop you from accidentally drifting into these obstacles. It also means if you find out that you don't have enough power to climb, you can always safely descend back to where you started, knowing that it was clear and the tailwind isn't going to hit anything. In this side-by-side -side comparison, you can see an MD500 climbing out of a confined landing area Using the max performance takeoff technique, you can see the crew looking around, making sure that they're clear of obstacles at all times. And once the height of the trees has been reached, the nose is gently pushed forward to accelerate into normal flight. For a multi engine helicopter, the takeoff profiles are similar, but there are some key points along the way where a decision is made to either continue the takeoff or to abort if there was an emergency. 
In a helicopter, it's known as the takeoff decision point, the TDP, that is similar to the V1 speed in a fixed wing aircraft. Let's first look at the clear air departure for a Cattley helicopter. This involves accelerating before climbing. The pilot must accurately fly the takeoff profile to hit the takeoff decision point, which is a combination of speed and height above the ground. If you correctly fly that profile, if the space available is sufficient and the Cathay certified helicopter is within the correct weight and performance limits, the takeoff is said to be as operating with a performance class 1. This is the highest standard of safety in helicopter flying. If there was an engine failure before the takeoff decision point, take the EC 135 or 145 for example, which has a clear area TDP of 30 knots and 20 feet, there's a sufficient remaining engine performance to bring the aircraft back to a landing in the space available. Once you've passed through the TDP, you should continue to accelerate. If the engine then fails after this point, the correct technique is then to climb at the takeoff safety speed, known as VTOS, in this case 45 knots, and climb up to 200 feet using the maximum power of the remaining engine, which will give you a rate of climb of at least 100 feet per minute. This VTOS speed is slower than the maximum rate of climb speed, which is known as VY, but you achieve the VTOS speed quicker than if you were to continue accelerating all the way to VY, and therefore you can start to climb quickly, getting away from any dangerous obstacles. Once you hit 200 feet, it is assumed that you are now safely away from any immediate obstacles and you can now perform a level acceleration up to the maximum rate of climb speed VY and reset the power to a lower level. Then continue the climb up to 1000 feet, where the helicopter should climb at least 150 feet per minute. When taking off from a helipad, either at ground level or on top of the building, a vertical takeoff and landing profile is required, known as the VTOL. The VTOL 1 profile is where a helicopter lifts upwards and backwards. The takeoff decision point is at a set height above the ground, 120 feet, for example, at the EC145, which point, while still climbing, the nose is lowered slightly and the helicopter flies away. In the event of an engine failure before the TDP, you lower the nose and gently descend back to the helipad. However, if the engine fails after the TDP point, you quickly lower the nose up to 20 degrees nose down and try and build up speed towards VTOS whilst accepting the height loss as a trade-off. The profile is designed to ensure that you're still clear of any obstacles on the ground during this acceleration phase. A variation of this profile is known as the VTOL 2 or the VTOL 3, and these are used depending on the obstructions behind and ahead of the helicopter. The VTOL 2 profile is used if there's an obstacle behind you, but some space ahead, and the VTOL 3 is used if there's obstructions ahead and behind. In this profile, the helicopter first climbs vertically to clear the obstructions before then continuing. A quick note on performance classes. To operate performance class 1, even if the helicopter is certified to CAT A standard, you still have to correctly fly the designated profile, be within certified altitude, temperature and weight limits for CAT A operation, and ensure the area that you are operating on is large enough and suitable for any rejected takeoff or climb weight. Performance class 2 is where you fly performance class 1, however at some stage during the takeoff or landing, an engine failure may result in a forced landing. And performance class 3 means that if you lose an engine at any stage of the flight, a forced landing will occur. So, there you have it. Different types of takeoff and landing depend on the helicopter and the operating environment. In general, the helicopter is taking off from a tight area, take off vertically or backwards. However, if plenty of space exists, the helicopter will take off similarly to a plane to maximise the weight that they can carry. A multi-engine helicopter that is CAT A certified has set decision points to tell the pilot what to do at each stage of the takeoff if there's any engine related emergency. I hope this has been helpful and in the next video we'll cover the different types of landing profiles that helicopters fly. Until next time, take care.